The title for today's uh, seminar is Maintaining Level of Operational Effectiveness of a Security Operations Center Under Adverse Conditions. We have scanned the talk description and we really uh, found it interesting. Uh, all my uh, students are um, waiting uh, for this talk. We believe it will be of great interest to participants from any um, organizations, especially from uh, iron gas, ICT, and um, electricity departments. At the same time, the talk will open many research directions uh, for our faculty and students, and they can really benefit from the talk. My name is Nasr Minallah. I'm a professor of computer science at the College uh, of Computer Science in IIT at Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University. And today I'll be moderating this session. For this session, we have received uh, more than 230 uh, registration uh, till now. And uh, the format of this talk would be uh, first 40, 45 minutes for the presentation from the speaker, followed by a 10 to five minutes um, question and answer session. You can type the questions in the chat window and I will read it out uh, for the speaker during the Q&A session. Now let me introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor uh, Sushil Jajodia, who is the uh, university professor, BDM international professor, and the founding director of Center for Secure Information Systems in the College of Engineering and Computing at George uh, Mason University, USA. He is also the director of uh, NSF IUCRC Center for Cybersecurity Analytics and Automation. Uh, Dr. Jujudia has published uh, research uh, contributions and diverse aspects of security and privacy, including access control, multi-level secure databases, vulnerability uh, analysis, moving target defense, cloud security, and uh, steganography. He has co-authored um, um, authored, co -authored seven books, edited 53 books and conference proceedings, and published more than 500 um, technical papers in refereed journals and conference proceedings. He is also a holder of 28 patents, 17 of which have been licensed by successful startups. He is a fellow of ACM, IEEE, and IFIP, and recipients of many um, numerous research awards. According to Google Scholar, he has over 50,000 citations and his index, each index is 113. He has supervised 27 doctoral uh, dissertations. 13 of these graduates hold academic positions while rest are in successful industrial positions. With any further ado, and now I will request uh, you all to please join me in welcoming Professor Sushil Jajodia. Professor Sushil, uh, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can I share my screen uh, with everybody? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Let me do yes, we can see your screen now. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. So uh, it's a great honor for me to give this seminar. And I would like to thank Professor Nasser for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, this talk, the title is Maintaining Level of Operational Effectiveness in a CSOC Under Adverse Conditions. Uh, this talk is based on some work I did under a project on adaptive cyber defense. This project, by funded, this project was funded by RV Research Office. And there were three other universities involved in this project, uh, Dartmouth College, University of Michigan, and Penn State. So before I delve into the content of uh, my presentation today, I thought that I will give you a motivation for our entire project. Why is there a need for a new approach to cybersecurity? And uh, there has been a lot of work in this area already, on this topic already, but uh, we, there are some limitations. So what I would like to do is to describe the limitations 
And in order to address the problems fully, there are many scientific challenges. And so I will give a brief description of the scientific challenges we face. And then I will get into uh, uh, the content of my presentation and deal with the topic of CSOC. By the way, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me and I'll be happy to see, I'll happy to try to address uh, your question. So if you look at the current generation of cybersecurity technologies, they are largely static because the driving force, main drivers for uh, cybersecurity technologies is standardization, predictability, performance, and cost effectiveness. Now, so some of the techniques that are being used are hardening measures like improved security engineering to reduce vulnerabilities and attack surfaces. Uh, layering securities, they involve encryption, access control, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, and malware scanners, for example. Now, these, the current uh, uh, approach really uh, uh, advantages attackers. They know that our cyber defenses are static and what they can do is that they can continuously and systematically probe the network, find a way to attack the, attack the enterprise knowing full well that there are not going to be enterprises not going to be change it is not going to change and so they can come up with an attack with full confidence attack the system and know that their attack will succeed and the other thing is that once an attack succeeds attacker can stay inside the network for months and months and months Somebody did some uh, study of Symantec uh, uh, data set and they found that it takes on an average of 11 months before an attacker is recognized, is discovered. So that's a long time. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that our systems are not static, but dynamic. So we need to come up with methods. We need to come engineer a system that have homogeneous functionalities, but randomization, randomized manifestation. So what do I mean by that? Homogeneous functionality means that authorized use of networks and services is predictable and in a standardized way for users. So as far as your authorized users are concerned, they do not have, they do not face any difficulty. They do not see anything that's changing. But for the attacker, we need randomized manifestation because they plan an attack and once they come to attack the system, they find something that is very, very different. And so if you look at the warfare during Second World War and so on, cyber deception always played a great role and what we in defense is it did in defense so we need to do the same thing when it comes to cyber security so here is briefly a slide that tells you why we need an adaptive cyber defense the, if you look at the bottom uh, bottom uh, 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 bottom of this uh, graph, you will find that the green line is just the current state of the system, current state of the enterprise. Now an attacker, the, the attacker, when they attack the system, and that's the blue line that you see going from top to the bottom, so when the attacker in the beginning has no knowledge of the in system, but over time, once they attack the system and they get into the system, their knowledge of system increases and their uncertainty keeps going down. Okay, so that's the blue 
um, curve that you see going from the top left to the bottom right. But on the other hand, if you look at the, the if, you, if your approach is adaptive, then the attacker, once they enter the system, it, they, that's the uh, maroon curve that you see on the top left. And so they get into the system, they find something about the system, so they gather some knowledge about the system. But after a while, when the system adapts, their uncertainty goes back to the top again. So in other words, the attacker is never fully knowledgeable about the state of the system because it keeps changing, his knowledge keeps changing. And the reason is that the system is adapting. So this is the same, uh, um, same graph but I have removed some edges. And the idea here is that an attacker, rather than becoming fully aware of the system under the static approach, his uh, knowledge is going to uh, oscillate between uh, some knowledge, then no knowledge, then some knowledge and so on. But it's not going to decrease as you see in the blue curve. So what are the benefits of uh, the adaptive technology? The benefits are to increase the complexity, cost and uncertainty for the attacker, limit exposure of vulnerabilities and opportunities for attack. So this approach has been very successful commercially that even if an attacker manages to uh, get into the system, they cannot persist for uh, 11 months as was the case, as, as, as is normally the case. Uh, they attack the system, th their exposure is, has a limited duration. And increased system resilience against known and unknown attacks. And the last thing is the adaptive cyber, pro uh, adaptive cyber defense, it offers probabilistic protection despite exposed vulnerabilities. So lots of researchers have been working on uh, uh, adaptive cyber defense or moving target defense and biological defenses and so on. And here are the, some of the methods that people can, researchers came up with. Uh, address space layout randomization, instruction, instruction set randomization and so on. So these are software based adaptive techniques. Then there are several network-based adaptive techniques, ID randomization and, and um, virtual-based uh, networks and so on. And the bottom line uh, is that these techniques, their aim is to give the attacker a view of a system that is different from what the system actually is. And so uh, that's, that's the uh, basic idea behind all these approaches. So when we started on this project, we came across this report written by uh, MIT Lincoln Lab, and it's an old report, uh, 2013. So that's almost 10 years old. And this re report described 39 uh, um, approaches that were adaptive. And of course, it's uh, many, many more than that. It's uh, more than 100 uh, right now. So what we wanted to do is we looked at these approaches and we tried to see how effective are these approaches. So rather than looking at all the 100 approaches, we focused on the 39 approaches which were in this uh, report. And so this is not uh, my slide, it's uh, taken from uh, Kate Ferris, who was a, a PhD student at Dartmouth, and now she's working for Microsoft, and uh, Professor George Simenko, also at Dartmouth. So what you see here on this uh, graph is um, techniques 
we wanted to know how many techniques are highly effective with medium to low cost, how many techniques are highly effective, but they are medium to high cost, how many techniques are medium effective with medium to low cost and so on. And on the right hand side, you have techniques that are that have low effectiveness, but they have high to medium cost. So now if you look at this, uh, uh, this chart, what you find is that there are lots of lots of techniques, but they are all uh, projected on, they are all listed on the right, shown on the right. And the reason is that these techniques have either low effectiveness or medium effectiveness, but the cost is either high or is medium. So the techniques that we found that, that there were a handful of techniques that had high effectiveness and, and medium uh, that had high effectiveness. And you see there are too many. So that just shows that, that uh, there is um, a good opportunity here to come up with techniques that have high effectiveness but they have medium to low cost. So these were the approaches that they had, they, they were not very effective, the cost was high. And the reason is that, that there were another problem that we found that the, the researchers were focusing on a particular attack. So if I go back to this slide, the SQL randomization, it just looks at SQL attack, that's it. Well, what we need to do is, we need to look at given an attack vector, how many techniques you should use, what is their overall operational cost, and can they be combined, how they should be combined in a uh, effective way. So, the problem is that we need to understand the overall operational cost of these techniques, when they are most useful, and most importantly, their possible interrelationships. So if I were to combine three techniques, what is the combined effect and effectiveness of the combined techniques, all these techniques? And then of course, we need to propose new techniques and then present adversaries with optimally changing attack surfaces and system configuration. So this was, uh, this is, as I see it, is a challenge that right now the biggest challenge is advanced persistent threats, APTs, and there are number of phases, reconnaissance phase, access phase, persistence phase, and there are the different techniques that can be used to uh, towards reconnaissance phase of the APTs, randomize network addressing and layout and so on. And so the thing is that we need to develop a framework to uh, uh, rigorously study these uh, various effectiveness of these techniques and then most importantly, see how we can quantify them. So what we did was that we have, I have a couple of papers here, a couple of, pa one paper and a book. And so if you'd like to know more about our project, we, uh, this, the first paper, which appeared in 2020, it gives the vision of, no, the, the 2020 is the book that, contains some results uh, we obtain as part of our research and it was published by Springer. And the second article, it appeared in the Springer conference proceedings, it gives the vision, describes the vision of uh, and motivation of our behind our project. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, get into uh, uh, the the, the uh, meat of uh, the, the topic of my presentation. So 
We have been, as part of our work, we have been working with people at Army Research Lab. And so they have a significant um, CSOC um, effort and they monitor alerts for a number of different uh, organizations, DOD organizations. And so the way the process works is that on the top right, they have number of sensors. So this uh, IDS is into uh, the, the number of sensors, they are collecting network traffic. So they may be local or they could be remote. So there are high performance computing systems throughout this country and they capture the network traffic and these network traffics are then sent to, um, uh, then they are analyzed by an IDS or a SIM system. And these alerts are then sent to, uh, then th these alerts are sent to uh, Army Research Office. Now, when the alerts are received, they are uh, queued and analyzed by CSOC. So there is a CSOC. So now this is a human process. So when the alerts are queued, a human will look at it. And what they will do is they will, uh, a uh, hypothesis, they will categorize these alerts as being category one, two, through nine. So what are these different categories? And these categories you see on this slide. So category one is a root level intrusion. Now this is a serious uh, attack, serious alert. So this must be, uh, this is an incident, incident. So this is a serious, uh, alert. Category two, user level intrusion. Now again, this is a serious alert. So it will be categorized, categorized as incident. Category three is unsuccessful activity attempt. So that means this is just routine uh, attempt and this attack did not succeed and so on. So what you see here is among the nine categories, some are incidents, but some are events. So the events are not serious and they can be ignored. Incidents are serious and they must be analyzed. So going back to the previous slide then, what you do is, what you see here is that an, uh, an analyst will look at the alert, categorize it as being one to nine, then they have to validate. So anything that's an incident, it will have to be validated by the team. And then the watch officer, so there is always a watch officer, somebody who leads the team, uh, CSOC team that is there uh, at that time. And the watch officer will validate it and generate a report. So that means at this point, that's the, uh, that's the, um, when a report is generated, it is sent to another team. What they will do is they will analyze the event, analyze the alert, try to identify what the problem is, how to mitigate it and so on. Okay, so that is not part of Seesaw. It's part of another team. So looking at it from a different point of view and then from that adversarial point of view, I try to address these three problems in our research. That an adversary, what they would like to do is to, they will like to impact CSOC operation. So the way they can do it is they can increase the uh, alert generation rate, uh, rate. They can introduce a zero day attack to uh, bypass the alert um, uh, identification system or they can destroy the links between sensor and the CSOC. If they do that, the, the alerts will not be analyzed. So here are some attacks. Now there are some internal factors that can, that can impact CSOC operation. So you have system shutdowns, power failures, uh, some tools are not available, Analyzed, analyst absenteeism, so if people don't show up for work, that uh, impacts the, the performance of a CSOC. And then 
credentials not available. So this is peculiar to uh, you know defense organization that all the analysts, they have to have certain clearances to look at alerts from certain sites. So not everyone can look at all the alerts. Uh, security clearance credentials of the CSOC analyst plays an important role. And so that's another, uh, if you don't have right credentials, uh, people clear at a certain level, then it can impact um, the, the analysis process. So when we started out with uh, working with ARL, one of the questions they asked us was that they have resources, uh, that they design their CSOC and then number how many analysts you can have so that for a normal operating condition, that they are going to uh, receive certain number of alerts. So many of these alerts are going to be critical and so on. But what happens if something unusual happens? And so how do they de determine that something wrong has happened? And then the other thing is that when something wrong happens, then they have to take some action. So why, why, what action they should take and when to take it and how much? So for us, when we looked at this problem, it seemed like a very nice optimization problem. And so what we did was that uh, I, I approached my colleague, a colleague who is, an operation, who is in operations research, and we decided to use stochastic optimization techniques to this problem. So the other problem was that, uh, and this is something that, uh, you know, CSOC organizations, they fail, that cybersecurity threats are on rise. On the other hand, demand for cybersecurity analysts is, uh, is, uh, is more than the supply. And then, so given limited resources, how to optimally manage the analyst workforce and what is the optimal workforce size? So that's another problem that we looked at. And the third problem was that when you schedule a cybersecurity analyst, you have to make sure that you have an, uh, a right number of people, right number of analysts in any shift. You have to make sure that you have a right mix of, mix of analysts. In other words, that some people are senior, some are uh, junior, some are medium. Uh, how do you make sure that the right mix is available? So what you don't want to do is to make sure in a shift, everybody is senior analyst, while in another shift, everybody is junior, because this directly affects the quality of uh, uh, analysis that is done during that shift. So we wrote a number of papers, but if you are interested in this research or in this topic, here are the papers that uh, uh, you should look at. And so the first paper that we wrote, it appeared in ACM test, and that's at the bottom in 2017. And the second paper uh, that appeared in 2016 and then so on, and uh, the last paper uh, it's that I have here, it appeared in 2022. So if you want to look at this research, you should go bottom up and look at these papers. Now, one of the things that we did was that we used stochastic optimization. And the other thing that we used was use reinforcement learning because you know everybody, uh, what you need to do is to automate the system as much as you can. And so what we try to do is automate the response by using uh, uh, by using reinforcement learning. So in some of the papers that you see uh, that appeared in 2016, 17, 18, you find that reinforcement learning, even in 2022 paper, plays a, a big role in uh, our solution. So what we did was that we developed a met metric for LOE. Uh, we developed a framework for monitoring framework and a decision support tool 
when to act and how much. So what we want to do, do was quantify. You see the way current things work is that when, especially when you're done, when you deal with humans, a uh, number of analysts, when something is going wrong, it really is art, not science. People are uh, an experience manager, know something is going wrong and they know how to deal with the situation and they find some techniques, they find some way to resolve the situation by using their experience. What we wanted to do was come up with uh, um, a metric that is quantitative, not qualitative. And so we came up with a very simple metric. And the metric is this, that if you look at when an alert arrives in a CSOC, uh, it takes some amount of time before the, analyst, before the alert is looked at by an analyst, they analyze the alert and come up with a decision. So that's total time for alert in which, uh, investigation from arrival to disposal of research, uh, of alert. And then if you look at all the alerts in an hour, let's say, or in a shift, and so in our case, the shifts were 12 hours. So in a 12 hour shift, you look at all the alerts that you received during those 12 hours, total time it took to investigate those alerts and divide by number of alerts you received. And so that's the average um, TTA, total time for alert investigation. That's the average time for alert investigation during a shift. Now, the other thing that we wanted, so, so what we just said was that in a CSOC, what you need to do, a CSOC manager has to set up a tolerance level for an alert per hour. So they can set a goal saying that and if, if an alert arrives, I should be able to analyze that alert within four hours, let's say. So the average, it will take four hours for the alert to for analysis. So what you see here is that's, that's the bottom green line. So that's the ideal uh, level of operational effectiveness. That's what the attacker would, well, that's what the CSAC manager would like uh, uh, as far as the performance is concerned. How long an alert takes to be, uh, takes to be analyzed on average. Now you see in actuality, the, the time is going to fluctuate depends on the various measures that I described in my uh, in in the slides couple of in, in in the in slides couple of slides back. So the actual TTA is going to uh, is going to uh, veer like this and sometimes it will go to uh, um, uh, you know it will go to the uh, yellow zone, then hopefully it will come back down. So the idea here is that you would like it to be within that range. So this is something that we discovered early on that if you look at the base case that you see at the bottom, and if the alert increase, alert rate increases by 10%, so that's the, curve that you see in the green. And if you take no action, TTA uh, is going to keep increasing like this that you see here. If it in increases by 15%, well, it's going to take longer and longer. And you see here that the average time is going to keep on increasing if you don't take any action. But on the other hand, if suppose the, if there is a 15% surge in alert arrival rate. And so suppose the alert takes for an hour 
it, uh, the arrival rate is an hour. What you see here is that if we don't take any action, system will recover, meaning that the alert rate will not increase anymore. Uh, TTA is not going to increase anymore. But what will happen is that the average time for analysis is going to remain high, as you see here. And so that's not the situation that you want. On the other hand, if you take some action quickly, this is what, this, this is the bottom line as far as this slide is concerned, that when the alert, uh, when the average TTA goes up, and if you take action quickly, the TTA can go down quickly. So in other words, if there is a 15% increase in arrival rate for four hours, okay, so that's what you see in the blue here. And if you take no action, then it's going to go into the red. So here were the insights that if you act quickly, then what you can do is you can reduce the average TTA uh, to the normal level. And, and that is your goal as far as uh, your CSOC is concerned. So what we did was that we came up with a <coughs> greedy technique, myopic. And so this technique is that take immediate action when there is an alert backlog, okay? So when the alert begin to accumulate, what you do is you take immediate action. The second was that take immediate action after alert backlog. And the third one was that we use reinforcement learning, okay? So we decided to use machine learning. So rather than have a CSOC uh, manager make the decision, let reinforcement learning make the decision. And what we found was that you can see the charts here that the uh, that on the right, what you see here is that the first two approaches, you can see that if you take immediate action after a few uh, few days, you run out after a few hours, you run out of all the resources and TTA goes into average TTA goes into red. Where second, same thing happens with the second approach, whereas with the third approach, which is reinforcement learning base, uh, what you can do is you can keep the average TTA within the acceptable range. And so that's the uh, benefit of using a reinforcement learning approach uh, other than the other approaches. So there are a number of graphs here, but you can see how this approach uh, really benefits uh, the performance. Okay. So one other thing that we did was that when the, when the, when you, when the alert starts to accumulate, and if you run out of all your resources and the, the average TTA goes into red, what are the options? What are the options? What can you do? So one approach that people have been using is that when the alerts begin to accumulate, you, you uh, adjust the alert uh, threshold. And so you can go to your uh, same system that you have and you can, um, so if you're using Palo Alto, you can adjust the range. So some alerts will be, uh, will not, uh, will not be, uh, uh, will not be flagged for analysis. They will be just discarded. And so the idea here is that if the alerts are too many, what can you do? So one approach is you have to throw out the, discard the alerts, there is no other option. And so the question becomes when to throw alerts, 
how many to, to throw out and which to throw out, which to discard. And so again, what we did was that we use reinforcement learning. And the idea we have, we, what we observed was that with RL approach, we were able to come up with a method which was much more efficient than ad hoc approaches that people use these days. And so uh, there was a threshold, threshold based strategy that's being used currently or analyst resource utilization based strategy. And so in all these approaches, uh, the bottom line here is I see that I'm running out of time that RL based approach was the most effective. And so summary is that if, if you want a threshold based approach, it ensures highest utilization of analysis, uh, analysts, but in terms of maintaining NOE closest to the baseline, the RL uh, approach works best. So I think that uh, uh, Professor Nasser, how much time do I have? Uh, you have 10 minutes more maximum. Okay, all right, thank you so much. So the second problem is, as I mentioned, is that cybersecurity threats are on the rise, demand for cybersecurity analysts outpaces supplies. So given limited resources, how do you optimally manage the analyst workforce? And how many people do you need? So the idea is that, well, this is, you know, the the if you have unlimited budget then of course and if you have availability of number of people you can hire as many people as you need to to uh, address um, uh, address the problem but if you have finite resources and if you have number of personnel available that is also limited then you need again need some metric. And so this is what we did was that we came up with a quantitative metric to come up with a way to determine how many people you need. So what is the risk? The risk is that if you have too few people, the number of alerts are not going to be investigated thoroughly. You would like to make sure that all alerts are investigated thoroughly, but if you don't have enough people, enough personnel, the number of alerts are not going to be, uh, um, uh, number of alerts are not going to be uh, analyzed properly. So, the idea here is this, that in a perfect world, we would like alert to be analyzed, 100% of the alerts to be analyzed perfectly, but it's not always possible because of the problems that I mentioned. So you need, need to come up with a risk percentage. What percentage of alert you feel that, uh, you know, if you didn't analyze properly, you will still be okay. So you have to decide as an organization that is the number 10%, is it number 30%, whatever. But once you come up with this number, then this is the something that is, uh, that's the bottom line as far as this research is concerned. So I cannot go into the entire detail of our model. You can look at the papers, but the idea here is this, that uh, suppose you have, what, what I have here is on the, so I'm looking at the graph. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but I am looking at the graph, which is in the bottom, uh, which is the top left. And so in the graph, what you see here is that analyst to sensor ratio is on the X axis and risk percentage is on the y-axis. Now, if so, 
So you see, if you if you look at, for example, if if you want your risk to be, let's say, fifteen percent, so that's what you see on the on the y-axis. Then the number of people you need is around 0.7. You need 0.7 analysts per sensor given a particular rate. Okay, so these are the kinds of uh, um, results that we can give you. And so not only you get, uh, you need, uh, so you need these many analysts if your risk percentage is this. So for 15%, you need about 0.7 analysts per sensor. And so the other thing is that you have 40% L1, 30% L2, 30% L3. The idea here is that you need 40% of the analysts that are senior. You need 30% of the analysts which are junior and 30% of the analysts which are medium. And so these are the plots that can help, that, that we can give you, that will help you with hiring decisions. Um, and then you see we have an optimization model. What that will do is it will give you how to schedule people and things like that. So again, here are the papers. And if you would like to, uh, uh, you know, investigate uh, uh, what we have done, to, uh, you can go to these papers. Okay, I think I'm going to stop at this point, Dr. Nessa. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Shushil. It was really interesting talk, and especially I like the comparison uh, with using uh, reinforcement strategies, uh, its impact on the sources. It's really interesting for me. Uh, uh, we don't have much time, so I will go to straight to the questions that we have received from the participants during the recruiting process. The first question says, um, do you see any uh, opportunity for using uh, artificial intelligence in the future um, cyber security operations center? What role will AI play in analysis? Well, this is a wonderful question. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, right now everybody is using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And people are beginning to discover that. Uh, uh, it's something that can really uh, change things. And so it can, so what we, we have already done that in our research that we showed how machine learning or reinforcement learning in our case. So we use reinforcement learning a lot. And so one of the things that we did was stochastic optimization to quantify the, the problem. And then we use reinforcement learning to come up with automated actions. And so, yes, I think that uh, uh, artificial intelligence has a great role to play. And the other thing is that we want to automate routine decisions. So there is always a role for program. Uh, there, there is always a role for human. And so it's the human who takes the final decision. but Currently, the way things are set up, humans have to make even, they have to make all the decisions, including trivial decisions. And so I think that machine learning, artificial intelligence has an important role to play. And in our research, we use reinforcement learning and we found that it is very, very effective. So yes, I think that, uh, uh, if we want real changes, uh, we have to really see how far we can push machine learning uh, as far as our problems are concerned. So yes, they have an important role to play. Uh, thank you, you very um, well explained. The second question uh, says, uh, some organizations generate millions of system logs every day from servers, firewalls, walls, and network devices. 
Is there any recommended period of time for how long we can keep these logs, logs for our record and reference? Well, that I don't have a nice, good answer for that. Um, it depends on uh, the nature of the organization. Um, but you see, it's impossible to keep the, the uh, you know, all the alerts forever. And so um, I think it's an, uh, it's an organizational decision. And you know that, that you don't have to keep everything. You could keep only things that are suspicious, okay, for historical reasons and things like that. The other thing is that lots of attackers, once they enter the, once they breach the enterprise, they will stay there for a while, or they will come back again and again. But again, it's it depends on the nature of the organization and uh, what your uh, what what do you think uh, is your risk prof, uh, tolerance? And so based on that, you have to make the decision. Correct, yeah, I think it's about the, you know, how many resources we have, we can keep some important data, rest you can simply discard. And the third question says, is it a good idea to outsource a cybersecurity operation center for monitoring an organization's uh, network? Right, well, this, this again depends on the size of your organization and the nature of your organization. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, you know, at universities, we have very limited resources. And so uh, uh, at George Mason, uh, we have really outsourced a lot of our cybersecurity uh, um, cybersecurity uh, work simply because we have limited resources and then we can hire a handful of people. And you see, and they have to do a lot of different things, you know, so we can hire a couple of people who are, who has to do, who have to do the vulnerability management, patch management, uh, alert analysis and so on. So they, they require a lot of different skills as well. So we have limited number of people requiring a large set of um, skill set. Well, in that kind of, with limited budget, in that kind of a scenario, it makes sense to outsource uh, some of these, uh, so, so, some of this work. Uh, but on the other hand, if you are a large organization, like uh, DOD, US Department of Defense, what they have done is that they have outsourced within the DOD. So as I mentioned, Army Research, uh, Army Research Lab in uh, Adelphi, Maryland, they manage alerts for a number of different DOD organizations. And so that's another approach if you're a large organization rather than every sub organization having their separate CSOC, you can outsource, centralize that piece of it. So that may be a strategy. Correct. Um, the fourth question is asking about, uh, sometimes real time response is needed for analysis of network. So is there any recommended tool for analyzing alerts uh, faster, maybe? Right. Well, you see, there are a lot of systems out there already. For example, I mentioned Palo Alto, and there are many others. Okay. Uh, Honeywell has a system. So there are lots and lots of them. Uh, they can, uh, they, they will analyze, they will uh, attach a threshold, uh, they, they will attach importance to it. And based on that, you can see, you, you can, uh, you can, uh, decide which alert you need to do, which alert you need to analyze quickly. But at the end of the day, uh, it's it's night nice, sites, you know, it's a difficult problem. Okay. Right. Um, next question: uh, How to avoid human error in analyzing um, alerts? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, the thing is that. The way to anal uh, the way to uh, avoid human error is that you uh, 
you automate as much as possible. You have uh, important tools and things like that. And you have to make sure that you have a, in a CSOC, you have proper mix of analysts. So in our optimization model, we try to pay attention to that. You see, you have human errors when you have everybody in a, in a particular shift, they're all junior or they all have their own tools. All these analysts, they have their own favorite tools that they use to analyze alerts. So if I am there, I have my handful of tools. And if somebody else is there, they have a different set of tools. So you see there are all these considerations that you have to take into account when you do staffing. So you have to make sure that uh, not everybody is senior, not everybody junior during a shift. You have to look at their clearance level, which I mentioned. You have to look at the tool set. What are their favorite tools? And then you have to make sure that there is a proper mix of analysts, their credentials, their tool sets during a shift. And so these are the techniques they can use to uh, and make sure that human error is minimized. And one other thing that we have looked at is, uh, you know, that certain people work together well and certain people don't work together well. So is there a way you can come up with, uh, can, can, can you use machine learning to identify uh, which group of people work well, which do not, and come up with some sort of a method, methodology? Yes. Um, the other question is about, is there any process or a standard protocol for closing an incident? Well, uh, so in, in the way the things work normally, as I mentioned, that in a CSOC, you identify which alerts are incident. Once they are there, you write a report and you hand it over to another team. Now, this team will look at all critical alerts, mm -hmm. come up with, analyze these alerts carefully, look at the necessary data, go back, et cetera, and then take some action. So the actions are in the form of the, how, what damage has been done, how to uh, 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 correct the damage, and then also how to, make sure that this doesn't happen again. But that's part of a separate team and that takes a lot longer. It's a longer process because in a CSOC, the, the way I describe a CSOC, it's, um, it, they, they have limited responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And so with respect to this other, uh, uh, you know, make sure how important it is, what needs to be done, et cetera, that's part of a separate team and it's a much longer process. Okay, this is probably the last question. Um, so it's asking, is it more useful to go for qualitative or quantitative analysis? I think it's, it came from your uh, discussion, so. Right, well, uh, well, I, I think that it's, it's both ultimately. Hmm. You know, what, what, we, what is going on right now, everything is qualitative. You know, when it, uh, when it deals with humans, when we deal with humans, it's always qualitative. And a CSOC manager decides when there is a problem, what to do, et cetera. So as I mentioned, that is a human who has to make the ultimate decision, yes. but we need to give them tools to, to sort of help them. And so that's where we have developed this quantitative measure. And you see, the idea behind it is that what we did was that we looked at the various approaches, qualitative approaches and quantitative approaches. And what we showed was that in many, many cases, quantitative works superior to qualitative approaches. And so we went to the CSOC managers and you know, in Washington DC area where I am, there are lots and lots of uh, organizations they do this work for government and for commercial uh, enterprises. And we went to them, we looked at their approaches and we compared them with our approach. And we found that our approach 
does better many, many times. So I think it's ultimately the answer is it's, it has to be a mix that, that if, uh, you know, uh, things can still go wrong, there could be uh, black swan incidents, right? So in those kinds of approaches, humans have to step up and do take action. Uh, thank you, Professor Shushil. It was really interesting talk, and we um, I'm sorry we took more than uh, six minutes uh, on top of the scheduled talk, but it was so interesting that we had to request for five, six, seven minutes more. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we will uh, contact you for, uh, maybe for future collaborations. I hope this talk everyone will enjoy the talk, and we're really thankful uh, for your time. Thank you. What I, what I will do, Professor Nasser, is that I'm going to send you the PDF of my, of my slides. So you will have it. And uh, if any of the people who uh, want, to, want to have access to it, your students, faculty, they can contact you and get the slides from you. Pleasure. Yes, we will do it. Thank you much again. And with this, okay. I'm going to close Thank the session. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.